Hi, I'm Naveen and we have Romy on the camera doing arty stuff and uh, I have Mortimer here to thank for this exhibition which uh, I hope to walk you through, which is a new phrase for me by the way, walking through because I haven't, as you know, done too many of these. Uh, so the show is called The Green Room of the Goddess and um, before I get into what I think that means uh, as a man of the theatre, I um, the first impression that I had as I walked in here, Mortimer, uh, was that this was somebody else's work. I really, it was like a kind of sense of, um, I mean, one felt pleasant about seeing things because it's so beautifully hung. But I also felt a slight sort of almost like a viewer audience for the first time. Everybody says this, but sometimes it's also true. And uh, so, thank you. And we will come back to, I hope you will talk to us about uh, why you hung it the way you did compared to perhaps the way I may have hung it and how mine may have suffered a little more and yours doesn't and yours comes together with it's giving me lots of new stories and interpretations for now i thought we could talk about this business of um, why green room and that there are two bodies of work there's one that's called performing the goddess and there's one that's called green room of the goddess and how these merge under this one theater symbolic phrase green room which means backstage which means preparation right for everything life photography you name it as far as this body of work is concerned mm -hmm. and uh, the interesting thing about performing the goddess is that it's based on the life and times of a man who used to be a very beautiful woman actor when i was growing up way back in the late 60s and uh, we have a theater in Bengal called Jatra, which literally means travel. So traveling theater. And these theaters played to vast audiences. You, you could actually, um, it's like going out into a village and you have like a 10,000 strong audience, which surrounds this sort of boxing ring of a theater space. And um, it's an all-night performance because people from nearby villages would come and it's impossible to go back. So you start at late at night and you carry on till four in the morning kind of thing. In those days, the themes used to be historical, mythological, and uh, were played to, you know, with grand gestures, almost like Parsi theater, um, because you were reaching out across distances to an audience. Um, so Chapul Bhadri was a female impersonator because in those days women didn't do, you know, I mean, they couldn't act in this particular form of theater. So he became a star of the Jatra and became known as Chapul Rani. Um, I'm trying to find, here's, here's an interesting image of um, Chapal Rani within a non-Jatra situation and if you jump between him as a star to when he became what he called himself an aging beauty when I met him he said I'm no longer beautiful and now women are playing the roles I used to play so he started to transform for about 30-40 nights in a year at some 70-80 rupees a night for three, four hour long performances of Shitala. Shitala is the goddess of smallpox. And the way Shitala works is that she would typically come to Mort or Romi and say, if you don't worship me, the pox will visit you. And so he used to do this to make a living because he was no longer in the Jatra. And what was interesting was that as a performer, he was very clear that um, in the middle of the performance, the audience got into a kind of trance and were convinced that this is a goddess and therefore they needed to seek blessings. So he would step into the audience and put Sindur on the 
young wives or collect money, people would touch his feet. But he was very clear that he hadn't transformed into some magical goddess or anything of the sort. It was the audience. He was a professional. He was performing. He had to collect money for his manager. And that was it. And that's how it kind of stopped. How did I come into his life? By sheer accident. I used to run a journal called the Seagull Theatre Quarterly, STQ. And uh, the founding editor of Seagull, Shomik Banerjee and I, were actually visiting his elder sister, Ketuki Datta, who was um, one of our divas and stars of the Bengali commercial theatre. And um, he was just a presence who came while we sat at the Chitai with a cassette recorder interviewing her and would occasionally give tea and I would thank him from my height of the Chitai to a standing person and um, it seemed familiar, right? And when we came out, I asked my editor, I said, who was that? He said, oh, that was Chapel Bhadri. And I got curious and I went back to him. And that's how that relationship began. Where I said, if you're performing Sitala in some street corner, uh, he says, I am, in fact, next week at a Sitala temple in North Calcutta. So I went and did a series of black and white photographs, which um, of the makeup process. And what was interesting was it was 150 watt bulb and a series of wooden platforms across a drain behind the temple. That was the green room where he and his group of seven or eight other actors, because they were going to perform a little mythological something. And um, I watched and photographed at this sort of range, the transformation. And there was a particular point, and I think it connects when you watch these photographs, there was a particular point where intimacy between the photographer and the actor man, actor woman, actor goddess, suddenly became embarrassing. You know, almost as if I was intruding because he became woman at some point, you know, as he put on his blouse and stuffed his bra and all the rest of it. And there was shyness on both sides, which was something I, noted and then carried on photographing. Those photographs became a part of an exhibition that was later curated as Woman Goddess, black and white ones, through Gayatri Sena, and traveled all over the world. And um, what that began was a relationship of trust between us, because one would take the proceeds of that exhibition, give it to him. And then one day he came to us and we made a documentary because he was very keen that he discusses both his art and his sexuality, his relationship with a man he was almost like a wife to, who was married with a child, and the wife accepted him. And how the relationship played out, I won't give it away, it's all, it became a very iconic uh, sort of coming out film and did all kinds of LGBTQ festivals and so on and so forth. Um, the color pictures that you see were done later in the course between the film making. We started to um, actually do a kind of almost formal uh, set of transparency films of the makeup and color. I just did it as a thing. And here, what the only other thing I can add is this business of photography for someone like me who is very shy and likes to hide cameras and shoot from all kinds of things, this was almost a formal shoot uh, compared to when I'm shooting a performance where I'm running around, you know, shooting with the light, against the light, audiences, reactions, all kinds of things. Here you just have this man again and, you know, almost posing but not being told what to do. So it was really my gaze looking at this man becoming a woman and then becoming a goddess. Um, that's, I think, sort of it in a nutshell. If you have any questions, Mart. Well, I mean, I think well, I'd be interested to know just from a larger perspective, your, your documentation of other performers <coughs> working within this mode mm -hmm. of female impersonators mm. and where that, did that idea spring from observing 
Chateau Bathory, or was this part of a, a pre-existing idea that you had wanted to document? No, my life is never pre-existing ideas, you know, however silly that sounds. It happens with who walks in through the door. She's always responding with excitement. So if you come in and say, I have this idea and I see possibilities and I would share it with you. And if you're not the kind who feels that's jaded, <laughs> we collaborate and become. So this was a collaboration with, um, it was a collaboration because we met accidentally. And also politically for me, I, at that point, the trigger was, I think the atmosphere in the country had changed, you know, there was, all kinds of things happening between Barbary and and later, you know, Godra was going to happen. It was almost forte. For me, the idea of man becoming woman, becoming goddess, somehow connected to the politics of the land in some bizarre way. I'm not entirely sure how, but all these things led to my wanting to do this. And for him, he was encountering somebody he could trust. And the relationship has remained over the years because normally what would have happened, and I'll come back to your question, just this one thing that most anthropological exercises, exercises of this kind create reputations for the author, the filmmaker, the photographer. Nothing goes back to your subject. We know this historically. People, you know, uh, go to the Andamans and do something on the Jarawa tribe and make a monograph in it. Here, again intuitively, it almost resurrected. People started to write serials for him after watching the film, you know, or the photographs, little ways like that. Um, people started to make feature films. Ritu Porno and Kaushik did this thing called Another Love Story. And he started to get work. And there was money coming back from every little thing. That was also important. We screened it on Tara Bangla, the big Oli channel at that point, and we were a little nervous because audiences, but the producers felt perfectly comfortable. We had a, a screening, like a premiere for 1200 people at the government hall, Nondon, the film complex. Again, I was worried, but everyone from the ushers there was in tears about the bit I thought I was worried about, the sexuality thing, because for them it was another love story which was being played out. Siegel Theatre Quarterly, the parallel exercise didn't become like a plan, it was a coincidence. I was at Manipur, we were doing a special issue, 200 pages of Manipur theatre, where I was, and there we discovered there was also something called the Somang Leela, where men play women. And all kinds of things come into play, the, the, the uh, you know, ruggedness of even a chapel, as in a face, or parallelly, when I was documenting Neelam Mansing in Punjab, and the fact that in her play she uses Nakals, who are female impersonators. Nakal, you know, the, these, you are the copy of the Almighty, that kind of thing at Sufi shrines they would perform, and so on and so forth. Again, you know, certain kind of rugged North Indian physiognomy, that kind of stuff. But when they transformed, they, I mean, it, was, it is what we've learned through all of our reading and the rasas and training and acting, whatever, that, you know, it's, it's like a Biju Maharaj standing dressed in kurta pajama <laughs> suddenly becomes Radha without transformation in this sense, right? So that's an exciting sort of moment. So it became a project like everything Siegel does, retrospectively. You know, you, if that makes sense, you know, you, you, when you put it together, it looks like you set it out with a plan, but otherwise it was an intuitive something. In quite the way, um, Green Room of the Goddess, uh, which is um, a, a kind of project which was initiated because Omi Chaudhary, our writer friend, wanted to do a piece for Granta in which he had this idea that he would, of how Calcutta transforms each year during the Durga Puja and the Kali Puja, and thousands of st architectural structures come up, which are cheek by jowl with the existing, uh, almost unplanned architecture of Calcutta with its own charm and so on and so forth. And uh, I got excited with that, the prep for welcoming Durga home 
you know, in a certain way each year. And then I extended it and I went to Kumartholi and um, discovered that in this sort of, you know, this kind of distance, I mean, three feet, four feet, 30 foot goddesses are being made, perspective. You can't go back and look at them, you know, all that. Uh, so I just, I was the fly on the wall doing, I did those black and whites where you did the city changing, so bamboo structures becoming pavilions, pandals, uh, to lighting. Um, you have, here's a, a black and white of that particular period uh, where the lighting comes into play. Um, and, you know, for example, the way lighting works is that two things that happened that time, 9-11 had happened, so some of the Pandals actually comment on the political events. So you had in color at College Street in the square, the water, the tank, twin towers coming down, planes flying and lighting. It was this kind of thing. The Latour earthquake was recreated in a park where the Durga comes into being, but you're also cremating bodies and crematory. It's like a strange thing that they do. Um, so, but the whole thing was about prep right, leading to the finished, but I took it beyond that into what happens after. So first there's a lot of irreverence, when you know, you kind of take a look at this, I mean, this image for example, um, you know, the, the, the way the hand with the watch, you know, sort of, this is not a woman or a goddess yet, this is clay, right, so there's irreverence. The chap may tuck a beady behind her ear or hang a shirt on the arm and work in his, you know, undershirt. And then for those five days, she gets anointed in the, you know, and then you pray. And then goes back the cycle to the river, the immersion. But between the actual immersion and the year long wait for the next resurrection, there is scavenging that happens. It's like it's like your and my idea of Mahabharat that they don't show on TV. Battlefields of bodies, crows, little children picking, you know, so-called jewels and baubles. So I did that whole route and that was with Durga. And when that finished, because it follows instinctively, I tried to do just the sort of backstage aspect of preparing Kali, which happens almost a few weeks later. So these are the result of that. Uh, and the only other thing is that for some reason, again, I didn't choose or plan, because you can't in these cases, you're walking in this tiny warren of lanes and shooting these pictures, but somehow the selection of pictures, and you come into this because you selected a lot of them, um, or the way they are shot, there's almost a kind of, um, it's almost voyeuristic in some ways, because you know, there's a, uh, somewhere there's a photograph of a half finished Kali stepping on Shiv's crotch, and then there's this hand and you know, the naked body as it were, um, and yet it's not flesh and blood. So I, you know, I don't have an articulation for it, but I'm sure somebody who reads these things better than I do. But I found, and also this thing I often talk about, which is the suspense of not knowing what you've shot. This is old fashioned film, right? So you're shooting and then you're out in half an hour, 40 minutes because I'm shy and agitated that I'm intruding. And then you wait for the damn thing to be processed. And then when it comes, you say, oh my God, I shot this like this. Right? Um, so it links to, I don't know, some, something in the head, some desire, some sense of whatever. Um, well, let me pick up on that point about the yeah. voyeurism. Sure, sure. With the image which you were <coughs> just pointing to, we had a, a friend of the gallery who came and was enjoying the exhibition and actually stopped at this image and said, you know, I remember as a nine-year-old growing up in Kanpur mm -hmm. and me and my friends during the, pro during the uh, uh, lead up to Puja mm -hmm. would crawl underneath the curtains where the idols were being made in order to see the idols naked because 
and it wasn't a sexual thing. It was mm. merely, it was just this wanting to break that wall mm. and, and to it, enter into this t- taboo space mm. and that it, the excitement of that voyeuristic moment mm. of encountering something mm-hmm. one perhaps shouldn't shouldn't be encountering. Mm-hmm. So I think that reveals, I think, itself throughout the exhibition. I think it, and it, it clearly it's a compelling mm. human emotion that we mm-hmm. all feel mm-hmm. to, in a mm-hmm. sense, uh, uh, view something that may... And so that also maybe brings in the idea of darshan in, within this context, because mm-hmm. here, obviously, once anointed, there is the accepted gaze mm. of the devotee, mm-hmm. the, the idol. But your exhibition, in a sense, being the green room, is all about mm. the unanointed Moment. Different kind of intimacy, yeah. and you've just triggered off a memory, which is nothing to do with what you're doing just now, and probably has everything to do with it. Uh, so very quickly, and you can edit this out if you wish to, is that my father, who was from Lahore, was to work with the Oberoi's, and post-partition, of course, it was Kashmir Oberoi in the days before film stars discovered it, and where the Oberoi Palace used to actually close down in winter before the joys of filming in winter happen. So he would be posted to the Oberoi Grand, where the existing Oberoi Grand architecturally now has changed. And I have an institutional memory of the damn thing, where the swimming pool was a place called the Sherazad. And everybody from Tony Brandt, Duke Ellington, people like that, and Japanese strippers. but. I mean, for a young person there who's knee height to most of the staff and colleagues, and there was Princess, the nightclub, I was all over the place and grew up on a diet of this sort of dancing and also stuff that was bad Xerox of Swan Lake with groups of women in nylon. You know, this was entertainment. And um, my sister was six years older. So in terms of sheer height, what I saw or what she saw and how at 11 at night we would sneak around the place because you were the assistant manager's kids and you were staying in, in a suite there till they found you a flat. Or, so you had access to a hotel where everybody either ignored you or patted you affectionately and tolerated you where others would not. So you were backstage in a different way between drum sets uh, you know, so one grew up on a, a kind of, uh, I don't know, I th- so I think the, uh, there's something there <laughs> which might also, but there you go. Um, you want to say, so round this off now, I think, by giving your take on um, well, the way you've mixed the two yeah. and to create one green room situation. Yeah, yeah. I when you were, when you were talking earlier and there's one way of reading the work, which is through the, the lens of ethnography, and that's certainly not the way that either you, I think, have intended the work to be read, nor we as a gallery intended mm. it for t- to, you know, in terms of the hanging. And as a gallery, we obviously work with artists who often um, use performance as a lens through which they, um, so people like Nikhil Chopra, C.H. Rahal, so I think it's very interesting the way that you have set up the relationship between, especially in performing goddess, between yourself and the artist, who you, in a sense, have given you've given as much agency as you have as you've given yourself as a photographer. You've given to the act, the artist himself. So I think when we were attacking the works, we perhaps came to it with a similar idea of how does one not treat the uh, subject purely as 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 an object, but as mm. someone who has their own agency. Mm. Um, walking through the exhibition, we decided rather than merely presenting uh, Chappell's um, movement from male to female persona, we thought to interweave um, the green room images because that would set up. Um, both the relationship between uh, the idea of uh, the goddess, the divinities working through both series, but <coughs> also this idea of the artisans in the green room as themselves having agency over the mm, sure. moment. And so again, not objectifying mm. them. Um, 
and equally we just felt that it would it would create a momentum that would lead lead the viewer right through the uh, exhibition rather than just bifurcating one half and the mm. other half. Um, there is a sense of beginning and ending, mm -hmm. uh, both within the uh, Performing the Goddess series and the Green Room series. Um, and it's interesting that when we reached the end of the exhibition, uh, you had said that one of someone who had viewed the works, I think a journalist, had actually seen the last image that we have put in the uh, exhibition as Carly anointing the artisan. That's in fact how we had also <laughs> read it. Even. And so this idea, this was in a sense the goodbye to mm -hmm. the exhibition uh, uh, and your your walkthrough, because it kind of, it, it's kind of giving you permission then mm -hmm. once you've been blessed to go out in, into the world. Um, the centre of the exhibition is the video, mm -hmm. and the forty-five uh, minute work really creates it, it gives the viewers, and especially when we've had groups coming through a great insight into uh, Performing the Goddess as a series because it, it, it in a sense, brings out so many, mm. so much of the backstory which otherwise may not be immediately readable through the photographs. The black and white images for us, and I think we, we discussed this, is, this is really your, for us, your relationship with light and in mm -hmm. particular your own background with, with how you have um, approached light through photography. And that's why it's important to have these works inhabit the centre of space. Um, apart from that, Naveen, I think, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much, mm. that was our Yeah, approach. just one last thought that you triggered off, when mm. you said something about divinity, mm. divinity is in plural, and it's actually struck me that the, there's a kind of almost divinity, so it's an aspiring divinity, because she hasn't quite become the goddess yet, neither has he. You know, there is kind of, so it ties up just a thought. Absolutely. So thank you.